Hi everyone, welcome to video one, an introduction to Bloom's taxonomy. I am Laura Brock, and I am going to be going through the information that accompanies the handout an introduction to Bloom's taxonomy. So what I recommend that you do is you either split your screen in half and type into the handout. It's just a Word document. Um, you know, you can pause the video to give yourself time to type, or if you'd rather, you could just print it out and handwrite on it. But I really recommend that you have that um, handy, the handout with you, because it's going to be really beneficial to you as you go through the information here. So we're going to start with some background information, some prerequisite knowledge, as we would say. And if you already know this, I'm really sorry if it's review, it'll just take a minute. But we always want to make sure that everybody is coming into the course with the same background knowledge. So let's get started. First thing I want to ask is what's a curriculum? Take a second and maybe think about what your definition of a curriculum is. If you have ever even considered a particular curriculum for your course, imagine what that looks like right now. Here's my personal definition that I have developed as an educator. This doesn't come from a textbook or anything. But I personally say that curriculum is the sum of all the information, concepts, skills, and experiences that a student will gain during the entire course. So basically, if you could just wrap everything up into one big bundle that you want your students to learn and be able to do as a result of taking your course, all of that I would call your curriculum. And so you would you could think of the curriculum as the big picture for your whole course. And many teachers make a curriculum map. It helps you plan how to break up your course into units. And so when I was a, a K-12 teacher, that was something that we were required to do. Um, we actually submitted them to our principal using this program called Curriculum Mapper. And our principal could go in and check out everybody's curriculum maps. So this is a real life uh, curriculum map that I made way back a long time ago. But it's a, real, it's a real curriculum map. Now, nowadays when I make a curriculum map, I just do it in Excel because I like Excel's ability. You can lump all these units together, all these uh, cells together. And then you can type in them individually. And if I type in this one, it doesn't affect this one. So I more or less made this exact template into an Excel document. And if you would like a copy of that, it's on the course website for this page. Uh, but ultimately, you know, use the curriculum map format that works best for you. But you should have similar information. So for instance, your curriculum map, you know, if you're teaching a 16 week semester, a 16 week course, you know, obviously it, this is for an entire school year, but you would have some unit of time, you know, is that week number one, or is it uh, month number one, or is it the first two weeks, or what unit of time is it and then have your content. So what is the big picture that you're learning during that time? What are your skills? So the skills that go along with each one of those. And then what assessments are you gonna be using to go along with each one of those? And then what resources are you gonna be using to go along with those things? So like I said, this is a, a real life curriculum map and note how long it is because it was from a full entire school year, August through May. Uh, so as we're getting started here, just, you know, kinds of things to keep in the back of our mind, because we're going to be writing instructional objectives and instructional objectives come from our curriculum. So what kinds of things influence your curriculum? Well, obviously, it would be the course master syllabus. That's answer number one. Right. Anytime you have a curriculum question, you should always go to the master syllabus and the outcomes from that master syllabus. Those uh, need to be front and center in the curriculum for your course. But then also you need to consider any standards that are written by the state or by your particular college or your particular department or your particular discipline. So if you have uh, state standards that you have to address or uh, standards that your particular college requires, right? All of that needs to influence your curriculum as well. If your students have to go through any sort of licensure requirements, obviously that needs to influence your curriculum. 
and any sort of standardized testing requirements. You know, obviously we want our students to be able to pass those tests. So things that um, are gonna be emphasized on any sort of national or standardized test should probably influence your curriculum in some way. Obviously it should not be your whole curriculum, but it should influence it. The things that interest your students and your particular areas of expertise should also be uh, influential to your curriculum, right? If you are really awesome in a certain topic, don't just put that on the shelf. Your areas of expertise need to be in there as well as the things that you know your students will find interesting. Okay, so is it important to have a curriculum map? Is it important to sit down and make a curriculum map for your course? That's just something for you to ponder on your own. Uh, if you think, you know what, I think that's a total waste of time. I could keep it all in my head. Well, then that's one way to think about it. Um, here are some reasons why I say they're important. It gives you a game plan. You know, you've got your whole semester broken up, got a game plan, you got an action plan, however you want to think about it. This is what we're going to do. And it helps keep you on track. It allows you to see the big picture. It makes writing a unit plan and a lesson plan a lot easier. It helps you with purchasing and managing your budget. It just makes your overall job easier. And it can serve as accountability, i.e. Uh, evidence that you taught the things that you say you're supposed to teach. So is it something you can just do in an hour? Uh, the bad news is no, it's probably not something that you can just sit down and bang out in one hour. Um, this is something that's going to require some thought and maybe in your department meetings, this is something that you could discuss as a faculty is okay let's make a curriculum map for blah 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 course, and I'll take this chunk of time and Bob will take this chunk of time and Fred will take this chunk of time right it's something that. Um, I think if you're teaching a, a course with other instructors, could be beneficial to discuss in those department meetings or in those professional development times, or even if you just want to make one for your own sanity, uh, I, I strongly recommend it. All right, now let's go to a unit plan. And again, think about what your definition of a unit plan is. I think my personal definition is probably pretty similar to yours. It's a section of time based on a topic, and it is a piece of the curriculum. Again, this is just kind of my personal definition. It doesn't come from any particular textbook or journal article or anything. It's just a definition that I came up with um, during my time as an educator. So it's a chunk of time, and it's just one piece of the curriculum. So your unit plan gets then broken down into individual lesson plans. If we go back to our unit plan, so this is um, in our, I'm sorry, our curriculum map. So this is that same one from a minute ago. Notice this is September 2000. <laughs> and uh, you see there's one unit and there's one unit. So I lumped those two together into one unit and this one into one unit. And so I guess I should have extended my line over here, but that's okay. So a curriculum map is the whole semester. Then it becomes unit number one, unit number two, unit number three, et cetera. And then within each unit, you've got individual lessons. And obviously the number of lessons in each unit would depend on you. You decide how many lessons go along with each unit. I just shoved a couple of them in here because I was running out of space, but you probably have more than one or two or three lessons per unit, but you know, kind of just to see the flow. So the curriculum map is the whole year or the whole semester or the whole course, however your course is set up. Then a unit plan is a particular chunk of time. And then a lesson plan is one individual lesson. So again, I'm really sorry if that was all review for you. If you already knew that, great, awesome. And if you are new to this, then please feel free to reach out to me and I will be more than happy to help you in setting up a curriculum map or a unit plan or individual lesson plans or whatever. Just use me as a resource. So this is a template of a unit plan. Again, this is one that I just made up myself, um, but I actually used it, no joke, when I was a K-12 teacher um, because when I was a K-12 teacher, we had to submit samples of our unit plans to our principal regularly for um, accreditation and that sort of thing. So this is something that I made in Excel. Uh, I just gave it an order. You know, these are the topics. Here are my instructional objectives. Da, 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 da. We're about to get into that in just a minute. Here were the state standards, how many days that 
uh, required, what were my instructional strategies going to be, what was my assessment going to be, and what were my resources. Now, I am a very like linear type A personality. I like having everything in neat, tidy little boxes. And so this is how my brain thinks. And even now, I still make unit plans and um, I still follow a very structured way of teaching. If that's not the way your brain thinks, that's not bad. That's not anything wrong. But if you are new to this and you'd like some help, please, please feel free to reach out to me. So let's just look at instructional objectives because that's the topic of this whole video. So how do we write an instructional objective? Well, you pick a Bloom's taxonomy level, which we'll get into in just a second. You begin with TSW, that stands for the student will BAT, be able to. So the student will be able to, then you put your action verb and your topic. And then the level of accuracy is not 100% required. Um, I like putting it there because it helps me have a benchmark of what I'm looking for. It may or may not always be 100%. So for instance, if you're teaching something that's difficult, it's day one of you know, the quantum mechanical model, you're probably not going to be able to have your students reach 100% on day one. So maybe your goal for day one is, okay, I just want them to understand it 50%. And I'm going to give a little think pair share question at the end of class. And if half of them come close to getting it right, then I'll be happy. So it's not always 100%. So here's your handout. This is the same handout that you have on the Word document. And again, I recommend splitting your screen in half and pausing the video and typing in your Word document or just print it out and handwrite, whichever works for you. But I really want you to have a, a physical solid resource that you can take away from this course, take with you into those department meetings or uh, group meetings and say, hey, look, this is something that I learned from this course that I took and let's use it. I really, I would really like you to have something tangible as a product of this class. So knowledge, bottom of the pyramid. At the knowledge level, the student can recall or recite facts, dates, places, formulas, recognize information as something they have seen or learned before. So for instance, if I am teaching about the Declaration of Independence, at the knowledge level, the student could literally tell me, okay, what date is associated with the Declaration of Independence? Or list one person who signed the Declaration of Independence. Or tell me one tenet from the Declaration of Independence, right? It's the bottom of the period, pyramid. They've seen it before. They say, oh yeah, I saw that at some point. I can tell you some basic facts about it. I think the number 1776 comes to mind. You know, basic, basic, basic stuff. That's the knowledge level. At the comprehension level, the student understands the information that they're given and what they're being asked to do with it. So if I give my students, again, pick your topic for your content area, because I know everyone in this course is teaching different things. So it makes coming up with examples on the fly really difficult. But just imagine for your course, Okay, knowledge is just regurgitating a basic fact. Comprehension is a little bit higher because instead of regurgitating a basic fact, you have a little bit more stuff tied to that basic fact. In application, the student can transfer information into a real life setting or a new scenario with minimal help from the teacher. So for instance, let's go back to our Declaration of Independence example. Knowledge would be, okay, there's something about 1776 involved. Comprehension, to skip back a little bit, oops. The under, they understand what they're, they're being asked to do with it. Well, you know, I, I know that this happened at a certain point in time because there were things that were happening in the colonies at that time. At the application level, Maybe the student could take that information. Oh, you know, I, uh, I celebrate July 4th. Uh, what are some of the real life implications for celebrating July 4th other than I get to light stuff on fire? Um, and again, they're able to do this with minimal help from you. So they know enough about the Declaration of Independence that when they put it into a real life situation, like how does this affect a student's daily life? Well. 
you can ask them that question and they could come up with some answers with, with little help from you. Keep hitting the wrong button. At the analysis level, the student can examine something, deconstruct it into its parts, classify, predict, and draw conclusions. So if we're going back to Declaration of Independence, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to deconstruct it into its parts, right? There are a ton of things we can talk about with the Declaration of Independence. We could classify the different ideas that are represented in the Declaration of Independence. We could draw conclusions based on what the author meant when we say X, Y, and Z. Um, there are a lot of places in the Declaration of Independence where you can break it apart. Synthesize, as we know, means to create. So the student can create new original items, ideas, or work using all of those lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So now if we're doing Declaration of Independence, you could have your students write their own Declaration of Independence, pretend that they were a colonist. How would they write their declaration? What major theories would they draw upon to write the Declaration of Independence? What are the things that they think would be the most important in writing a Declaration of Independence to submit to a king on the other side of the ocean, right? So now the student can be in the driver's seat and make their own Declaration of Independence. And then evaluation is like grading. So let's pretend that on day one, you had the students write their own Declaration of Independence. And then on day two, you had the students bring those declarations to class and now they critique each other. Okay, trade papers with a friend. And now you get to tear apart their uh, Declaration of Independence in a constructive way, of course. Obviously you would have to go over some ground rules for, for how we talk to each other appropriately and etiquette and all that good stuff. But in the evaluation level, there's a reason it's at the top of the pyramid is because you have enough skills underneath your belt that now you can appraise or assess someone else's work. And you can say, yes, these criteria or are great uh, and they apply here and they um, show that this is a really good production or no, this is trash. So this is at the top of the pyramid. So knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So knowledge and comprehension are considered lower level thinking, right? If you write an exam question using the test bank and it's regurgitating facts, that doesn't require a whole lot of work on the student's part to memorize those facts, it doesn't require a whole lot of work on your part to grade those facts. Those are just the, the bottom of the pyramid and you need facts. Obviously you need to have some foundational knowledge about whatever topic we're dealing with, declaration dependence of independence or whatever. You need to have some foundational knowledge. So I'm not trashing on it. I'm just saying that is the bottom of the pyramid. That's the least effort to teach. It's the least effort to learn. It's the least effort to grade. Application and analysis are considered mid-level thinking um, because there's more skill involved in producing assessments as a teacher to measure mid-level thinking. And there's more work involved on the part of the student to complete those tasks involving mid-level thinking. And then synthesis and evaluation require higher level thinking. That's obviously a product that we want our students to do, but can we have a higher level thinking for every single thing? Well, that's up to you and your topic. You know, it's sometimes, Maybe you do just need to regurgitate a fact to put it on a um, standardized test. But maybe your students have to practice, do a, a lab practical or a clinical. Ooh, okay, well that definitely requires the higher level thinking. So you have to design your instructional objectives based on these six levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And so that's where we're gonna stop for this first video. In the next video, we'll be learning the action verbs that are associated with each of these six levels. And there's an accompanying handout to go with that. I hope that you found this video useful and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And I hope you have a great day. Bye.